It's a wild west of market forces in the reproductive technologies. The bioethics debate. You're working with an egg. You must see the distinction. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. I'm Lucky Severson. Welcome to Secrets of the Sequence. You know, major scientific advances often force us to re-examine what we value, what is worth pursuing, and what should be left in the petri dish or the lab. Genetics is the same, but the stakes could be much higher since we're playing with the code that determines who we are. As we learn more about how our genes operate, we face the challenge of using that information in ethical ways. Your ethics may not be the same as mine. How can free and free market nations sort out the ethical questions of genetic biotechnology? Let's look at a couple of areas of concern. When Louise Brown was born in England in 1978, she caused an international uproar. Brown, you see, was the first baby born as a result of in vitro fertilization. About in vitro fertilization, the term refers to a process whereby an egg is removed from a woman and fertilized by sperm in a petri dish. After the egg divides several times, it is implanted in a woman's uterus and the infant is born either through the birth canal or by cesarean section. That first in vitro baby might be considered the beginning of the genetic revolution. Since then, somewhere around a million so-called test tube babies have been born, and we still don't know whether they are more likely to have developmental problems than people conceived outside of a lab. The handful of studies that have been done suggest a greater likelihood of neurological problems. But a free medical market and couples desperate for children have made in vitro fertilization commonplace and completely unregulated. You got egg sales on the internet, you got embryos being stolen to make babies, you have no standards for uh, a clinic opening up, rates and prices are all over the place. It's a wild west of uh, market forces in the reproductive technologies. But on what grounds should our options be limited? and who should make those decisions. These are dilemmas facing people and governments around the world. I think it would be morally reprehensible to despair at the possibility of trying to exercise some control over with it, where this engine is going. Um, the atomic scientists had a genie out of the bottle at the end of World War II. The biologists are in the same place. Dr. Leon Cash chairs a council on bioethics that President George Bush set up last year to advise him on ethical issues emerging from the life sciences. But President Bush made his first decision to ban research in therapeutic cloning before the council had finished examining the issue. We know you have better things to do than memorize the latest scientifically accurate or politically correct terminology for these things. So let's define our terms, consulting once again with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Genome. Let's try therapeutic cloning. Even that term is controversial, Lucky, because it implies this form of cloning will be used for healing and as such has a positive connotation. President Bush uses the term research cloning because it seems to him more neutral. Scientists say for real neutrality, you should call the process somatic cell nuclear transfer. Thank you. Perhaps now we can go on to talking about what we were talking about. Therapeutic cloning, or somatic cell nuclear transfer, involves removing the nucleus from a human egg and replacing it with the nucleus of a cell from a donor. The nucleus, of course, contains the donor's entire genetic code. As the egg divides, it develops an inner core of embryonic stem cells, which could be harvested and returned to the donor to replace or repair damaged tissue without the problem of tissue rejection. Some fear that permitting therapeutic cloning could lead to reproductive cloning, the cloning of human beings, or even to manufacturing embryos to harvest their healthy organs for the sick and disabled. Our children 
are gifts to be loved and protected, not products to be designed and manufactured. Allowing cloning would be taking a significant step toward a society in which human beings are grown for spare body parts and children are engineered to custom specifications. And that's not acceptable. But that is an unacceptable position for many who believe therapeutic cloning may lead to cures. This clump of cells that will never leave the laboratory is not the union of male and female. It's an egg that gets its DNA I mean, its nucleus taken out. Christopher Reeve was a big screen superhero before he was paralyzed in a horse riding accident in 1995. Now he devotes much of his time to learning about and campaigning for research on spinal cord injuries. He believes that stem cells cloned from his own DNA might heal his spinal cord and become his path to walking again. You're not even working with an embryo, you're working with an egg. That has not been fertilized, you must see the distinction. There are 400,000 people with spinal cord injuries and there are many, many more who have other disabilities that could have been helped by stem cells. Not surprisingly, the religious right sees it differently. If it's uh, embryonic stem cell research, it all involves uh, the destruction of an embryo. And uh, so it begins with an abortion. What if one fetus, one person were sacrificed and through those stem cells, many lives could be saved? I would say it's never a right to do wrong to accomplish right. There you have the heart of the dilemma facing us on so many genetic questions. Which is the greater good? What we're dealing with here is not simply a case of good versus evil, but a case of competing goods or a case where the evils such as they are so closely embedded in the goods that you can't simply tease them out without foregoing the one or embracing the other. As a biologist, I've come to somehow regard the earliest stages of human life as not humanly nothing. To other bioethicists, that position seems simply wrong. The notion that potential ingredients of people are the same as people is one that doesn't seem to me to be factually correct. And the debate doesn't stop there. Consider pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. If Louise Brown's parents were creating a baby today, they could check before the embryo was ever implanted in Leslie Brown's womb to be sure it was free of some genetic defects. Robin Maria McLaughlin used that technique to ensure their second child would be free of cystic fibrosis. I think the whole procedure is um, somewhat miraculous. That that we could go forward preventing children from coming into the world suffering this disease and, and possibly others. Cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs, Huntington's, there are a number of inherited disorders which can doom their victims to short, difficult, miserable lives. Years ago, when amniocentesis became an accepted part of pregnancy, many decided that it was best to avoid giving birth to children with these diseases even though terminating the pregnancy was the only other choice. It would be preferable to do uh, diagnosis and not create such a child. I think that is a moral good. It is an improvement to uh, not have to end a fetal life, but to, in fact, use the right gametes. I don't know of any religion that doesn't say that what parents should do is try to make life better for their kids. But that same technology might one day be used to eliminate embryos that have characteristics that are simply unwanted, not necessarily detrimental, say freckles. Or parents might want to create embryos that embody their ambitions to be perhaps a great musician. We are acquiring a kind of sensibility which says we will accept nothing less than perfect. But um, it seems to me that prenatal and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is of a piece with what, we, what, what has become common practice. And I don't see that we're going to turn our back on that. Once you start doing positive eugenic modification to those things, should the time come, and I think it's going to be a while, then you're in a different ballgame. And the boundary between negative and positive is not as bright as some people want to say it is. And that is the problem. 
When the boundary isn't clear, who should decide where it lies? Should we make it a matter of law? If you believe in choice and you don't want to wind up with a government-imposed vision of genetic normalcy or genetic desirability, you've got to let people make their choices. And I would allow some limits if it turned out that uh, um, the choices that individuals were making about genetics were skewing uh, the safety or stability of a society. To what extent should individuals be free to, to make their own decisions on these matters? Yeah, look, um, science is by its own self-definition morally neutral, whereas if you've got uh, moral dimensions to a question, those are really for the community as a whole to decide. Those require very gentle, delicate considerations of regulation in which we try to tease out the legitimate and beneficial uses from the illegitimate and harmful ones.